speaker. Uh, Dr. Arta Holly is the director of the Heart and Lung Surgical Transplant Program at UCLA and will be speaking to us on Heart Transplantation 2013. Good morning. This is uh, my disclosure slide. This is a, uh, a picture of an operating room in 1968 in South Africa where the first human heart transplant was performed. And this is the front page of the local newspaper about a week later showing the picture of a, the patient with his wife. And um, what's more interesting is on the uh, left side you'll see the picture of the donor and then the picture of the mom the picture of a boy who received one of the kidney transplants, and at the bottom is the picture of the surgeon who did the heart transplant, something that these days is considered a taboo given the HIPAA rules and things like that. This is the surgeon, Christian Barnard, who performed the first human heart transplant. He actually trained um, with Norman Shumway for about six months at the University of Minnesota, went back to South Africa and beat him to the first human heart transplant by about um, 45 days. Um, he uh, continued to uh, operate as a heart surgeon for about um, another 10 years or so and became disenchanted with heart transplant and heart surgery and focused his attention on dermatology. And he developed some anti-aging creams for several years and, uh, and then he passed away about 10 years ago in Monaco of all diseases, it was heart failure. And, and here's the man who is the real father of heart transplantation, Norman Shumway, who really spent many years to develop and perfect the technique for human heart transplantation. It's of note that among all the procedures that we do these days, heart transplantation has never been subjected to a prospective randomized trial and it will probably never be. It is considered the gold standard for patients with refractory heart disease and uh, will continue to play a role, albeit at a lower rate because of the scarce donors. This is a slide of a um, international registry that's voluntary and it shows that in the world there has been about 4,000 hearts or three 3,500 to 4,000, but in the U.S., the number has been fairly stable between 2,000 to 2,500 per year. If you look at the diagnoses, it's predominantly cardiomyopathy and then uh, dilated cardiomyopathy and then ischemic cardiomyopathy <laughs> that has been fairly stable, maybe slightly increased in the dilated cardiomyopathy cohorts. And this is a, an informative slide that gives you a perspective on this field, which is the survival of heart transplant patients over the course of the past 20 years or so. There is uh, more than 96,000 patients in this, uh, in this slide with a conditional half-life of 13 years. By that I mean if a patient survives beyond the first year, they have 50% chance of being alive 13 years later. Um, these are some of the predictors of one-year mortality in uh, heart transplant recipients. Temporary circulatory support, ECMO, has an odds ratio of about three, three times the mortality. Congenital versus dilated cardiomyopathy, total artificial heart, as it stands, it has a mortality of about, or odds ratio of about 1.9. Temporary continuous flow devices, such as Centromag, uh, renal failure, uh, the recipient being on the ventilator, continuous flow devices that are uh, chronic, like, such as HeartMate 2, and previous transplant, as well as the pulsatile flow devices, still carry a, as a risk factor for these cohort of patients. Um, I'd like to talk to you about th four major issues facing the field of heart transplantation in reference to the the recipient cohorts. First is we're seeing more and more older patients. If you look at the slide and look at the years, you can see that patients over the age of 70 are slowly beginning to show up more and more. Patients over the age of 65 are becoming more common amongst the heart transplant recipients. 
Now they have, there are some issues with older patients. There, although we consider age a relative contraindication, but there's no question that age is a surrogate marker for other conditions. At UCLA, we do not have an absolute age cutoff, but we consider patients over the age of 72 a potential candidate for the so-called alternate list. The oldest patient that has undergone heart transplantation at UCLA was a 76-year-old gentleman who lived for several years after the transplant. There have been several reports looking at single center experiences with older patients, and under those selected circumstances, the older patients actually do fairly well. What we do know is that they have decreased incidence of rejection and probably an increased incidence of infection, which requires an alteration in their immunosuppressive therapy. This is again a busy slide, but looks at the uh, survival according to age. There's no question that if you take it all as comers, patients over the age of 70 and the older patients do worse than younger patients. What about patients with congenital heart disease? This is a topic that will be discussed further throughout this conference, but there is an increasing number of these patients who are um, becoming available or presenting for heart transplantation because of the improved survival and improves, uh, improvements in their corrective surgeries. The reason for their higher risk is because they have had multiple prior surgeries, collateral circulation, and because of the presensitization these patients at higher risk for heart transplantation. If you look at the um, survival of heart transplant recipients according to their diagnoses, again, patients with congenital diagnosis have a, uh, um, initially a worse, di worse survival, but th because of their youth, they actually balance out towards the end. Patients with VADs, we heard from Dr. Kwan um, very well that these this mechanical circulatory supports are here to stay and, uh, and will probably continue to improve. But when we look at the data, there's no question that they are associated with increased mortality after heart transplantation. And it's, there are several factors for this. And if we look at the, uh, the survival according to the type of the devices, although the, the P's are statistically significant, but if you look at it very grossly, you see that they're fairly the same. But when compared to patients who do not have a ventricular assist device, the, the VAT carries a, a higher risk. What about retransplants? We're seeing more and more younger patients presenting with uh, uh, refractory rejection needing for retransplantation, although it uh, constitutes about less than 5% of the patients, it is clearly associated with a lower survival when compared to a primary transplant group. However, once they, uh, if you select them properly, they can do just as well as the rest of the cohorts. And I, uh, again, this is a busy slide, but I want you to look at the, uh, the yellow part because that, the yellow bars, that's the most um, relevant and the most recent group. If you transplant a heart transplant recipient that has been transplanted within the past 12 months, they don't do as well. Their survival is less than 60%. But if they, they're five years out, you can see that their one-year survival is about 85% or so. And if you take all the primary transplant, it's about the same. So it's a matter of selection. Let's say a few words about the surgical aspect of it. Um, the original Norman Shumway and the Lauer technique was a biatrial technique which we rarely do anymore. The current technique that we do is a bicable. We connect the S superior vena cava to the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava to the inferior vena cava. This is a, um, a drawing of, of a donor heart. The uh, dashed lines are where the heart is transected. And this is the donor operation where you take the heart out. And this is what the heart would be like, the donor heart at the donor hospital with SVC, IVC, aorta, pulmonary artery, and the left atrium. And this is the chest of the recipient after their old heart has been removed. There is a cuff of left atrium, pulmonary artery, aorta, uh, SVC, and IVC. This is a donor heart that's prepared for the anastomosis. This is the during the process of approximation of the left atrium. And this is the completed operation where the, all the anastomoses, there are five anastomoses that need to be made. What about the immunosuppression? 
virtually um, the, the first six months after heart transplantation is the period that the patients are most likely to get rejection. And because of that, induction immunosuppression, which by that I mean a very high dose of immunosuppression is administered early after transplantation. We use variety of antibodies, depleting antibodies, including ATG and uh, anti-CD25 antibodies for during this phase. If we look at the number of heart transplant programs that do induction therapy, it's 50-50. Uh, 50% 50 of the programs do induction therapy. We are amongst those that do not routinely perform induction therapy. We reserve that for patients who have end-stage kidney disease or other comorbidities or infections. And when we look at the distribution of the uh, induction immunosuppression, the IL-2 receptor antagonist is the most common one, followed by ATG. OKT3 is rarely being used these days. And when we look at the survival based on the induction versus no induction, although again, the, since the numbers are so big, the P's become significant, but if you look at it carefully, you see that the, uh, uh, at, the, at least in the short term, they're very equivalent. What about the maintenance immunosuppression at, uh, at the end of the first year? As you can see, cyclosporin has been used less and less frequently, replaced by tacrolimus. The mycophenolate is replacing azathioprine, and the steroids is being used at about two out of every three patients at the end of the first year. As you know, we make a concerted effort to reduce or remove steroids after the first year in, in, in appropriate patients. And it's currently practiced such that about two-thirds of the patients still remain on a steroid after the first year. What about the management of acute rejection? When any of these patients present with uh, ISHLT grade 2R rejection, which is done by biopsies, or they have any hemodynamic compromise, they're usually treated with their augmentation of immunosuppression or addition of a uh, po uh, polyclonal antibody. In patients who have antibody-mediated rejection with hemodynamic instability, we throw the kitchen sink, whatever that we can get. And in patients who have refractory rejection, photophoresis or total lymphoid irradiation is the only option that's, that's available. To make a diagnosis of rejection, all of these patients have to go through a endomyocardial biopsy, which involves a stick in the neck and a uh, sample of the, uh, the septum. And um, that's the only way we can make the diagnosis in addition to their clinical criteria. Um, drug level monitoring is another way to monitor these patients for their level of immunosuppression and echocardiogram. As you may know, there has been many issues with biopsies in terms of inter-observer variability, sampling errors, other lesions, and variability in frequency. The issue with the drug level monitoring is, is it's a blood sample and it has no relevance in terms of the clinical condition of the patient and the immune status of the patient. And it's a valuable information about where the, what the le level of the drug is, but it doesn't tell you about how the heart is doing. <laughs> Echocardiogram has some utility, but it has limited sensitivity and specificity. Which brings us to the issue of, of gene expression profiling, which is a new way of trying to assess how the donor heart is doing and how the recipient is reacting to the donor heart in absence of doing biopsy. It requires a sample of peripheral blood and assaying for 20 of the genes that are associated with an acute infl inflammatory process. And this is a study that has been um, spearheaded by Mario and, and the group. And it has been shown that it is of utility in special circumstances such as patients who are stable and beyond several months after their original transplantation. Hopefully, with greater acceptance of this technology, the number of endomyocardial biopsies will be reduced in the near future. What about the complications of uh, heart transplantation? This is a busy slide, but if you look at the, the most, uh, the farthest left, you can see that at 10 years, virtually every heart transplant recipient has high blood pressure. About two out of every three, one, every three heart transplant recipient has some element of renal dysfunction because of the immunosuppression. And a vast number of them have dyslipidemias with about 30 to 50% diabetes, 
and about half of them have a condition called cardiac allograft vasculopathy. The coronary disease in the transplanted heart is a common cause of the death among heart transplant patients. The incidence is about 50% at five years, and it is characterized by an intimal thickening throughout the entire coronary bed. There are many factors that cause CAV, including immune and non-immune mediated factors. It's diagnosed by the annual angiogram or intravascular ultrasound, and the management options are quite limited. You can, risk, you can alter the risk factors, you can use proliferation signal inhibitors, you can use statin, the role of antiplatelets is unknown, and lastly, PCI versus retransplantation remains the only other available options. What about infections after transplantation? The first month, it's usually the technical and surgical related issues. Between one and to six months, it's the opportunistic, mostly pyogenic bacteria, occasionally viral and fungal. Beyond six months, it becomes community-acquired infections. We have come a long way in terms of prophylaxing against the uh, infectious complications, and at UCLA, we are very fortunate to have a, an incredibly talented infectious disease group headed by Dr. Bernie Kubak in terms of management of this cohort of patients. What about malignancies? It's a uh, common cause of death after the first year. The post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders and skin cancers are the most common ones. And the risk factors are the intense immunosuppression, EBB positive, and younger patients. And the treatment is predominantly reduction of, of immunosuppression. Again, it shows, this slide shows that the malignancy, the types, the most common one is skin cancer, and then the lymphoma is following that at any time during the, uh, the course post-transplant. The, the holy grail for heart transplantation or any organ transplantation is uh, development of a state where you don't have to give immunosuppression. It's a state of permanent immunological acceptance without the need for immunosuppression. Um, the, it has been achieved in the kidney transplantation and uh, in heart transplantation it is being tested in experimental setting, but has not yet been tested in, in humans. Let me just spend a minute or two to talk about some of the advances in, in heart transplantation. And the, the most important one is the advances in immunosuppression. We have come a long way from the early stages or early days when we gave um, steroids at high doses to everyone. The immunosuppression is now being tailored and it has significantly reduced the incidence of complication. Another advance in, our, uh, in the surgical aspect of heart transplantation is the so-called beating heart transplant. This is the old way of, or this is the current way to, at many centers of doing heart transplantation. We send a team out to the donor hospital where they actually uh, basically pour a lot of ice on the heart to stop the heart and then uh, we put it in a, uh, in a bag uh, with multiple plastic bags and we put it in an igloo cooler. And uh, we have many of these at UCLA and we transfer them to UCLA via helicopter or uh, whichever mode of transportation. And this is how the heart arrives in the, uh, in the operating room and it's a, in a flaccid uh, state. Now this is a, a new platform that has been developed where we take donor blood from the donor at the donor hospital and use that to prime a circuit, a machine. So the donor blood is circulating through this machine and the donor heart is attached to this device where it will be continuously perfused with warm, oxygenated, nutrient-enriched blood and maintained in a beating state. The heart is warm and beating on this machine while it's being transported from the donor hospital to the, uh, to the recipient hospital. When the phone call came this is a that the heart was available, obviously we had this mad dash to get dressed because it's 1 a.m. in the morning. You have to think about the donor, the donor's family having a tragic event. Right now, transplanting a human heart is still extremely difficult for three reasons. One, the supply is very limited. Only a very small number of organ donors end up actually donating viable hearts, and not all of those make it into recipients. Two, 
You can't just swap out a heart. The heart and recipient have to be a good enough match. But the biggest problem is that you only have six hours to work with. The longer the heart is outside of the body, the riskier it is to implant that heart. And the reason these problems are such problems are because of this. Despite all the advances we have made in the past 40 years in modern medicine, we still are dependent on a cooler and the time clock that we are w working against. The concept of using a uh, heart on a machine has been a um, intriguing and a fascinating subject. Most people that see it uh, have a definite emotional reaction. It looks like something you should never see. The organ care system is an integrated system that allows us to keep organs alive, beating and breathing between the donor and the recipient instead of storing them on ice. Transmedics and the, um, the pioneers in this company have been um, working on this concept for two decades now. After the heart is removed from a donor, it's attached to what is called the Organ Care System, or OCS. It's kept warm, it's fed nutrients, it circulates blood, and it's essentially kept alive. Now there's no longer a race against the clock. OCS allows us to take that variable out of the equation. A good illustration of this issue is the fact that on an annual basis, more than 30 or 40 hearts in Hawaii go unused. Because of the distance, these hearts cannot be transported to the mainland. This technology can potentially afford those hearts to the rest of the country and vice versa. Organ care system technology has the potential to revolutionize the way we practice solid organ transplantation. Heart in a box is going to replace the old therapy. Nothing to do with ice. Ice is over. This is clearly the coolest technology that you could ever hope to work for. Everybody in the company is so focused on enabling more patients to receive this gift of transplantation. We are highly motivated to make sure that this is successful. That should be a happy feeling that the donor didn't completely die. That donor is now alive in me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ardahali.